with His glory, and that is uh, partly what our message is about today. If you turn your Bibles to uh, Colossians chapter number 4, we'll continue in our series, The Preeminence of Jesus. The whole theme of the book of Colossians is talking about how Christ is superior to any other. Now, of course, during that time, the Apostle Paul was writing that there were other uh, influences, uh, false teachings that were creeping into the church, and so he's writing to help protect them and warn them, and really did so by uh, just bringing up the truths about Christ. Now, as we've progressed through this book, uh, we're now in chapter number four, so almost done. Pastor Daniel will be preaching next week, and he has a really cool portion of Scripture. Some people say, well, how much information, verses 7 through 18? The characters that are listed there in those verses are really unique. We don't have a ton of information, but we do have some information. And when you read the Bible and you start looking at different Bible characters, uh, it is oftentimes good for us to then look at ourselves and say, you know, if I was there, would I have acted like that person or would I have acted like this person? How would I have acted in that situation? And uh, so it's always a good challenge to us to kind of look at the different characters and understand the background a little bit that we have there. So in Ephesians, or Ephesians, Colossians chapter number four, uh, last week we looked at verses, uh, verse number two and three. Uh, I kind of went through this uh, quickly, but uh, picking up again in verse number two, and uh, just notice what it says here, continue in prayer, that has the idea of being devoted in prayer, constant conversation with God. It's not just picking a specific time in the morning, in the evening, all that's good, having uh, concerted times where you just spend uh, more time in prayer, but just throughout your day, just talking to God, having a conversation with Him. As you're driving down the road, and a thought comes to your mind. Just say, God, what do you think about that? And then listen. Uh, I was challenged many, many years ago by a Sunday school teacher uh, after he had already been uh, gone. Uh, this is back when I was a teenager. And I ran into him, and uh, we were just talking about uh, him teaching Sunday school class when I was younger. And I had mentioned to him how much I enjoyed him. And he said, uh, in, uh, regarding prayer, he just said, you know, it's interesting, John. He said how much we talk about prayer. The Bible speaks to prayer. Uh, it is something we're commanded to do, but he said, when's the last time you listened after you prayed? And that just stuck me. I was just like, hmm, that's, that's a really good, valid point. When you pray, do you just pause and listen? Not that God's going to speak to you audibly. I wish he would, but he doesn't speak that way today. He gives us his word, but he puts impressions on our heart sometimes. And uh, it's interesting that if you're just in a moment of prayer, as you're asking God for specifics, pause for a moment and just say, God, what do you think about that? Maybe he'll redirect your prayer. Maybe you'll just sense a direction to go. I don't know how it'll all work for everyone, but just kind of interesting when you consider this. So Paul was emphasizing here in the verse two uh, of continuing, being always in this uh, pattern of prayer. He says, uh, with that, the word watch there, we talked about being alert. Uh, And many of you confessed last week like I did. How many times have you prayed and not really thought about your praying? You just kind of prayed it and not, yeah. Yeah, we, we really sometimes just check out, but we're saying the words, we're just not really thinking about what we're saying. And here he's talking about praying, being alert, being watchful in your prayers. Uh, of course, the illustration, Jesus in Gethsemane, he went away from his disciples, he said, watch and pray, stay alert, pray. He came back, what were they doing? Sleeping. And we went through that kind of like, if I, if I lay down and pray, I'm going to fall asleep. If I kneel at my bed and pray, most times I'm going to fall asleep too. So it's good to stay alert when you're praying and uh, be, be watchful in that. Then thirdly, with thanksgiving. When's the last time you spent time just thanking God for things? Not just asking Him for things. Thanking Him for your salvation. Thanking Him for the blessings of your life. Thanking Him for what has good. Even thinking, thinking simply. Uh, when's the last time you thank God for taste buds? Say, all right, you're being silly now, Pat. No, when's, when's the last time you thank God for feeling a hug from somebody you love? When's the last time you thank God for things that we get to experience in life that are positive? We have plenty to say about the negatives, don't we? But when's the last time you just said, hey, let me just brag on you here for a little bit, Lord. Thank you for these things. And so Paul said, hey, you should be in a spirit of thanks uh, as you pray. And we went into that a little deeper. So now we look at verses 3 through 6 in particular. And the title I gave to this message this morning is Watch Your Mouth. Watch Your Mouth. Now, that comes off as a negative. Paul's going to actually use it as a positive. That's not in your text here, but it's my title for this. But I would assume that many of us have had the experience as a child in your developmental years, such as I had the experience of your mother saying to you, you better watch your mouth, young man. Now, I don't know about you. Anybody want to confess? Yes, you've had that said to you. All right, a few of us. 
How many had a parent or somebody that was in your life that actually would say your full name when they were upset at you? That you knew? All right. I never had that, but uh, my, I had nicknames that were not so nice ascribed to me. Uh, but anyways, uh, that's something that uh, we understand, that somebody says, watch your mouth. Paul's not using it here in a negative way, but I thought that would just be a, a little bit to get your attention. Uh, so in our text, we see two ways in which we are told to watch our mouths. This is predicated on the fact that chapter 3 instructs the believers to seek the things which are above. If you're a believer, this is pertaining to us, continues to contain, uh, pertain to us, that we are to seek the things that are above, things that are honorable, things that are godly, things that God would have as desire. We are to set our affections on things above. We are to desire what God desires. It's as simply as I can make it. That's not easy, even as a Christian, because I have my own desires. You have your own desires. Sometimes we have fleshly desires that are not right in the eyes of God. But here the Apostle Paul says, set your desires, your affections, your mind on the things that God uh, wants. And then it also goes on to say there in chapter number three, or in chapter number three and, and even further back, but talks about putting off certain undesirable traits, certain ungodly characteristics. Put those things off from your life. Verse 45 even says, put them to death, the sexual perversions. He says, put those things to death, put them out. And then he says, put on these things that are godly and honorable. So this is for the Christian who's trying to live for God to say, yes, I'm a Christian. Uh, I want to honor God. So Paul used all these uh, to kind of give us a, an understanding that we are to act a certain way as a believer and yet our, our as we know, many people in around the world have seen poor examples of those who profess to be Christians. Uh, sadly, I was one of those for a, a time in my life as I was growing in my faith. I was a poor example of a Christian, as one who's put their faith and trust in Christ. And I was working through things in my life and trying to uh, uh, live for God, at the same time hanging on to the fleshly desires of this world. And I had to just finally just say, God, I just want you to just take over. And uh, he doesn't do that. He makes us work for it in the sense of honoring him and glorifying him. So I want to give you the two points here this morning. Number one, in verse number three and four, speaking the mystery of Christ. So what Paul is doing here is giving us uh, this understanding in regards to being a witness for Christ. First of all, it's to be bathed in prayer, but he now is going to turn this to speaking, how we speak as a Christian. Notice in verse number three, he says, with all praying and all your prayers, also for us, that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ. Now catch this, for which I am also in what? Bonds or in prison. Paul understood that I'm in prison for already speaking the mystery of Christ. And he says, but I'm praying that God would open up even more opportunities that I could keep speaking the mystery of Christ. And last week I went into a little bit about how God did open up the opportunities that even uh, the book of Philippians, Paul mentions that even in Caesar's household, people came to Christ because of Paul's witness. How cool is that? The very guy that he was going to stand before uh, Nero, in his household, people were getting saved uh, because of Paul's witness. So Paul was praying that others would pray for him, that God would open up more doors of opportunity for me to be a witness of the mysteries of Christ. And so with that, we also understand that is our task as Christians too, that we are to be witnesses of the mysteries of Christ. So what are these uh, mysteries that he's speaking about here? I'll get to that in just a moment. But I want you to know, first of all here, he says, praying also for us that God would open up this door. And so he's speaking about prayer. This type of witnessing must be preceded by prayer. As he's already taught, we should always be in a mindset of prayer. We should always be praying. Uh, when you're going into a store, and you got to go about doing your, Lord, help me be a witness in this store. How that will happen for you, I don't know exactly, but I've had it happen, or I've had run into somebody that was in need of something, uh, run into somebody that was having a difficult time with, with uh, 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 helping someone out, uh, run into situations where I just struck up a conversation, a conversation in the, the aisle way at a grocery store, at a Walmart, it doesn't matter, that the gospel came up and I was able to witness to somebody. I've been in stores and prayed right there for people in the store as we're going about doing our business and just stopped and conversation struck up and just all of a sudden in prayer, whether it was for their health or whether it was for uh, salvation or something else. You just never know if you actually pray and you're, you're conscientious about being a witness for Christ, how God might open up the door for you to be a more effectual witness 
for him. And so this idea of speaking preceded by prayer, as we already learned. Secondly, under this, the speaking, this speaking is the priority of witnessing. What is the priority of witnessing? Witnessing. It's witnessing the mystery of Christ. So it's important for the Christian to understand what is this mystery of Christ then? Well, you know it, but let me just define it as the Bible defines it and give you more context here. This mystery of Christ is, in, if I could just give you the, uh, the easy understanding, it's the gospel. It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for your salvation. Do you believe that Jesus is God? Do you believe that he died on that cross for your sins, that he was buried? He resurrected. And now for all those who truly understand that and ask Jesus Christ to save their soul, they receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. That's part of the mystery, but it goes a little further than that as Paul describes it in uh, not only here in Colossians, but also Ephesians, the different books of the Bible. The word mystery means mysterion. It's something that was previously not revealed. And the scripture speaks to this. That there are certain things that God did not reveal to certain people in certain generations and for many, many years. But he did so in the New Testament, as we call it the New Testament time, for the, to the apostles. He gave them insight that nobody else had insight on. And he said, now's the time. Now's the time to reveal this mystery to the known world. And so back in the first century, Jesus uh, was the one sent to die for us on the cross, but it was the apostles who would then take the message of this mystery to proclaim it to both Jew and Gentile alike. Listen, <coughs> excuse me, go, go back to Colossians chapter 1. Just as a little understanding, we already studied this, but it's good just to refresh it in our minds. Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse number 25. And here are the Apostle Paul's words about him becoming a minister for a particular purpose. He says, whereof I am a minister according to the dispensation. That means he's been uh, uh, given a responsibility, a stewardship, a management of something. The dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. That, that idea of fulfilling there means to make fully known, to bring something to understanding. Verse number 26 even the mystery which has been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. The word saints in your Bible, by the way, means those who are true believers. It's not something you wait to become a saint. You're a saint once you get saved. It means a set-apart one for God. And so we understand here that the Apostle Paul is using Colossians 1.25, describing what his responsibility that God gave to him, as well as the other apostles, to reveal the mystery of Christ which is uh, to bring others to this full understanding of what it's about. Look at verse number 27. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is, say it with me, Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect, that means complete, in Christ Jesus, Whereunto I also labor, striving according to the working which works in me mightily. So Paul's talking about he gave his life, he gave his energy to his responsibility that God gave to him in particular to preach the mystery of Christ. And here in verse number 27, 28, he says this mystery is also now given to the Gentiles. Remember, the Bible tells us that salvation first came to the Jews. The Jews were to be a witness of this. They did not receive that. Jesus turned to the Gentiles, and it is both Jew and Gentile that now can come to faith in Christ together. And so this is this understanding. But notice again what it says here, which is Christ in you. The, 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 the phrase there, Christ in you, speaks of the gospel message. The only way that you have Christ living inside of you is if you understand the message and you receive the message, and now you become a follower of Jesus Christ. And so what he is explaining here, that this idea of the, the mystery is Christ in you the hope of glory? Do you have that hope inside of you? Now, hope isn't a wish in the Bible. Hope is an assurance. When we say, I hope in God, that means I have an assurance. No questions in God. The world uses hope in a different way. They use it as a wish. When somebody says, are you going to you know, go on vacation this year? Well, I hope so. It's a question mark. The word hope in the Bible is not a question mark. It's an assurance my hope is in God. My assurance is in God. And so term, words change meaning, but this one is uh, definite in the Bible. So speaking is the priority of witnessing. This speaking is the mystery. We speak the mystery of Jesus Christ. And so this was unknown prior to this. 
Remember, this was an Old Testament uh, Jewish population that, that, that they were speaking to. And in their minds, there was one God. He was, in, in essence, God the Father, Jehovah God. This Jesus is, is make-believe. This Jesus is somebody that we don't trust. This Jesus is a new religion that's being started. And since they rejected the message of Christ, even though all the messianic promises pointed to this Jesus being the one who he claimed to be, they couldn't receive it. So the message then was turned to the rest of the world also, so they would hear the message very clearly. Ephesians 1.7 speaks of this um, mystery in this way. It talks about the riches of his grace for forgiveness. This is what you get being a part of the mystery of Christ. Ephesians 3.6 that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promises in Christ by the gospel. So it's a totality of all this information pertaining to the gospel message. Ephesians 3.8, it talks about the unsearchable riches that are found in Christ. Colossians 2.3, in whom, Jesus, are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So it's, it's more than just understanding the gospel. It's everything associated with, with this idea of Christ being your Savior. It's a wonderful uh, description. And this is what uh, the Apostle Paul says, I was tasked, I was given this responsibility to preach this mystery of Christ, to reveal it. Peter did the same, and the other apostles did the same, and now that same message we are to take as Christians and let people know this is the actual message of the gospel, that Jesus Christ is the one and only true Savior. So Paul continues the idea now by instructing believers to speak the mystery of Christ and to speak it in a certain way. He says, I want you to speak it with gracious and salty words. Say, what? Yeah, look at it. Verse number, uh, Colossians chapter number four, and uh, we'll read verse number five, but then six. Verse number five, it says, walk in wisdom towards them uh, that are without, redeeming the time. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. So speaking the mystery of Christ. So we understand, uh, first of all, that was the main point. Now we're talking about speaking with the wisdom of Christ. Wouldn't it be great for you and I to be able to speak knowing that our words were actually the wisdom of Christ? Well, you have absolute access to this. If you are a believer, then you have access to to the God who saved you, and he wants to help you to speak words of wisdom that he chooses, not that you just make up as you go. And so this is the wonderful thing about this next uh, two verses, speaking with the wisdom of Christ. As I mentioned, first of all, we need to understand these gracious and salty words. One of the marks of spiritual change after receiving Jesus as your personal Savior is a change in your speech. Also change in our actions. Prior to salvation, we pretty much did what we wanted to do. We didn't care about God. We, we weren't embarrassed by our sin. But now that you put your faith and trust in Christ, there's certain things you say, ooh, I know this does not make God happy. I know this is not how I'm supposed to act as a believer. And, but yet, sometimes we struggle with overcoming those things. And so we must understand that speech is also one of those things that kind of notes who you are. Not only does the indwelling of Jesus in you change your desires, but it also changes your thoughts and actions. But this also requires you spending time with him. If you don't spend time with Jesus, he's not going to rub off on you much. There's an initial at salvation, uh, a desire, a thankfulness, a passion for God. I've watched this many times, though, wane and kind of slack off in people as they don't really spend the time they need to with the Lord. And they say, well, I remember the day I got saved, but ah, I'm just, I'm not sure anymore. I really, I said, well, tell me about your faithfulness to the Lord. Do you pray? Well, once in a while. And do you attend church anywhere? You're getting taught the word of God? Mm, sporadic. Well, do you read the Bible for yourself so you can see what God wants? Not really. Well, you're just dried up then spiritually. I mean, you might have made a, you might have made a decision to trust Christ, but you're not investing in it. You're not having a diet you're not having a relationship with God. That's why so many Christians just don't seem to live for God. And it's sad. We live in a day and age where we're just so consumed with so much other information, we don't spend the time necessary to have God work in us and through us. And so the overall theme of these verses is being a witness for Christ in our speech. 
This requires thinking the way God thinks. And you can't think the way God thinks if you don't spend time with God. When you read this book, it's amazing how even in a course of a conversation, little portions of Scripture come back out. Why? Because you're saturating yourself in the Word of God. That's why we encourage you. Get, you, know, you, get, you have so many different apps now. You can have the Bible. We, we do an app every year for the church, and uh, it's Bible reading, and everyone reading together has videos also to explain portions of Scripture. It's fantastic. If you're not in that, you should get in that. Uh, but it's, it's one of those things that the more you listen to the Word of God, instead of turning on your favorite tunes in the morning, why don't you get the Bible uh, on your apps and just let, let that portion of Scripture just play over and over again as you're driving to work. You'd be amazed at how much recall you have just by listening, even if you're not fully paying attention. But you should have a concerted time sitting down and studying a portion of Scripture and learning what the words mean and understanding it in its uh, larger context. So you say, oh, I understand what this book is about now. I understand what this portion of Scripture is about. But if you just keep going on like, well, whatever the pastor says, you don't retain all that. There's no way. I could, I, if you ask me after a couple hours later on today, what was your message on? I'd be like, um, I got a second. I could probably give you my main points, but all the details? We can't retain all that. You have to go back and be willing to study for yourself. If I were to speak in a certain accent, and I'm not good at trying to act out different accents, but uh, my dad was originally from Louisville, Kentucky, we would go down once in a while, visit our in-laws, and I noticed that if I was there for uh, several days, I started talking like a southerner. And uh, if I talk like that, now I'm not saying that's, that's Kentucky, because some of you might target it somewhere else. You've got Texans. We got, we've got every, every state in our church sometimes where all the military personnel come through. But when you start talking a certain way, you're like, oh, you're from Texas, or you're from the north, or you're from... If I say park your car in the garage, you'd say, oh, you're from Rhode Island. No, you're from Cranston or Boston. You know, we all have little different accents. Well, not in the same way, but Christians have an accent. And our speech should be heavenly. Now, I'm not talking about you're going to be Joe spiritual and every time you talk, you're just going to be like God's words coming out of your mouth. I'm talking about there should be a change in our speech as one who now has become a follower of Christ. I'm talking about the content, for sure, but also about our tone and also about um, um, the, the accent of, of God in you, a gracious tone to who you are, because that's exactly what God says here. Notice what it says back in our text. Let your speech be always with grace. Many of you are familiar with the term grace, meaning favor, uh, and which is true. But before I explain that, let me just give you two ways in which you can affect change spiritually. Willpower and walking power. Willpower and walking power. Many of you have heard of willpower. That is uh, typically inside of us. Some would call it just good character. Uh, my wife has good character in the fact that uh, if you put a piece of uh, chocolate cake and a cup of coffee in, in, in front of me, uh, it wouldn't be much time before both were gone. And I'd probably lick the plate if there was frosting on the plate. My wife leaves one little piece of whatever she eats. And I was like, are you not going to eat that? It's like, nope. And I'll either reach over or before she walks away, I'm like, give me that. I'll, even if I'm stuffed, I'm like, that's good food. Don't throw that away. They're starving people in other parts of the world. Not sure how my gaining weight helps that, but hey. But you recognize that that's good character. Or we say willpower. You're going to work out, start a New Year's revolution. How long does that last for you? Willpower only works so long. Spiritually speaking, willpower is very short-lived. You must have walking power. And that walking power is different because that walking is with the Spirit of God. And so I have a little statement I put here about this. Willpower will become weak power if it's not strengthened by walking power. And so what is walking power? Well, walking power, as we find in Galatians chapter 5, verse number 16, it says, walk in the Spirit, Holy Spirit, walk with the Holy Spirit of God, and you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh, the things that we know we're not supposed to do. The more time you spend walking with God, the less desire you'll have for ungodly things. Now, it's not perfect. I get that, because I struggled with this for years, still wanting to do ungodly things. But the more I spent with God, the more I understood the Bible, the more I memorized scriptures on particular sins, 
the more I felt like God was working in me to help me to overcome those things. That's not for salvation. That's after salvation. You only walk with the Spirit after you get saved. And so we must understand then that this idea of willpower is based on your determination, but walking power is based on your submission to the Holy Spirit. And if you read through that portion of Scripture, Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 through 23, it talks about walking, uh, uh, walking in the Spirit so you don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Verse number 19 labels a whole bunch of sins, things that we, th- that we should not be doing, and it says, and such like. I mean, the list goes on. Many more things that we are, uh, need to be careful as Christians not to participate in. But then it transitions, and he says, but... The fruit, or that which is produced by the Holy Spirit, is, and it starts with love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. There's nine of them. I'm not sure I got them all in there. But anyways, those are the qualities that the Holy Spirit produces in you. This is the beauty of this. After salvation and you start walking, communing with God daily, and He starts working in you spiritually, you start reading and understanding what, how God wants you to live based on the Scriptures. It's others that will start noticing it in your life. They'll say, something's different about you. I'm like, well, what? Oh, you used to do this, and I don't see you doing that anymore. Oh. It used to be more, much more harsh in your tone. Okay. As happened to me after I got saved and went back and visited some friends a while after, uh, they're in a conversation with them, and all of a sudden one of them says, John, you're different now. I was like, well, how so? He said, you're nice now. I'm like, oh, thanks. But they saw a change because I was now trying to live for God and honor God in my life. And my speech was changing. My attitude was changing. My tone was changing. And it's so important we understand this, that this speaking with the wisdom of Christ means that we'll be speaking uh, gracious words, but we'll be walking with the Spirit, and He can produce that in you. Some of you would say, there's just no way. It's just who I am. It's just the way I grew up. There's no changes. Uh, I would dare you give God a chance, because the guy standing up here speaking, there is no way I would ever be a public speaker. Dyslexic, struggled through school. God called me a pastor, you're like, you're talking to the wrong person. I want to be behind the scenes. I just want to be work with my hands. I don't like to speak. God just has a way of changing things. It's interesting sometimes where this idea of speech is concerned. Notice in verse number five again, it says, walk in wisdom. When I submit my thoughts and actions to God's thoughts and actions, that's when this change starts taking place. Remember, all this is involved with being a witness for Christ. If you claim to be a Christian, your action should back that up and your speech should back that up. People should see something different in you as a believer. So how does a believer witness to a non-believer? His walk is backed up by his talk. He lives honestly. If he makes a mistake, he admits it. If he blows it, which you will as a Christian, you're going to blow it somewhere. Take responsibility for it. That's like uncommon in our world. Just admit, I blew it, I'm wrong. People will stare at you like, whoa, he actually admitted that he was wrong. They don't know how to take that. And just say, look, it's my fault. let Let me try to fix that. Living honorably is representing Christ because he knows we're human. He knows we're frail in our frame. Isaiah 55, verses 8 9 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, and so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Do you realize that we need God's wisdom to be an effective influence on those who are without Christ? You must spend time with God for Him, for you to have God's thoughts, to have His mannerisms. So then notice here here in verse number 5, it says, walk in wisdom towards who? Towards them that who are without. What do you mean without? Who are the without? Non-believers. People who have not put their faith and trust in Christ yet, those are the ones that you as a Christian are to be a good example to. Yes, you should be a good example to other believers, but... In particular here, Paul's talking about witnessing. 
you ought to be a good example in your community to what it means to live as a Christian. And so we, we notice then to an unbeliever, these are those who are missing out on certain things that we take for granted as Christians. They are still walking in darkness when you are living in the light of the glorious gospel. They are with hope et- eternally, no eternal life with God. They are without the peace and security of knowing God as their Savior. They are without fellowship with God and with other believers. They are without the forgiveness of sins and the freedom that comes from guilt when you know that God has settled it all on your account. And I can go on and on and on with the list for those who are without. The main thing, they are without the security of knowing Jesus Christ as their Savior. That does not mean that they're not doing well in their life. There are millionaires and billionaires who are unsaved, as well as there are people who claim to be Christians who are really not. Only God knows the true heart of someone. But as you, if you claim to be a believer, are your actions and your speech backing up the fact that you say that you're a Christian? And this is what Apostle Paul was getting at. Your witness to those who are without God needs to be backed up by your words and by your walk. Ephesians 2, 12 and 13 states that at the time that you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus, you who are sometimes far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. What a blessing it is to know that you have been, uh, your sin debt has been paid for by Jesus Christ. It's not something you work to get. It's already been paid for. You just receive it. And then you start growing in this faith in Jesus Christ. And so going back to the main point here, that we are to speak with the wisdom of Christ. How so? We're to walk in wisdom. And by walking in wisdom, we are to walk wisely, obviously, being mindful that you present Jesus Christ, represent Jesus Christ, not yourself. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 20 talks about us being ambassadors for Christ. We walk in wisdom by living righteously and godly in this present age, Titus chapter number 2. You are to live righteously and godly during this time, to be an example of Christ. Walk circumspectly, that means diligently or on purpose, Ephesians 5. Walk in good works, Ephesians 2.10. And again, the list goes on and on. There's so many ways for you to be an example of Christ, but you won't get that if you don't spend time in communion with Him. You won't get that if you don't pray for God to give you wisdom on how to overcome your own weaknesses and strengthen you for every single day. Notice it also says here, redeeming the time. What does it mean to redeem the time? Some have explained to me it means to grasp every moment that is given to you as a witness for Christ. Some of you are going to be the only person, only Christian that somebody in your workplace will ever know that's a genuine born-again believer. Are you taking advantage of being a witness for Christ? Redeem that time. Redeeming the time also has the idea of seizing every moment that is given to you. When you have the opportunity, take it. When you have those moments, use the best of your time to be a witness for Christ. And then verse number 6 talks about speaking with wisdom. We have gracious words, salty words, and I'll put in here knowledgeable words. So let's unpack this real quick as we come towards the conclusion. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. So again, Paul's talking about being a witness for Christ. This is verbally. One of the things that we need to understand about gracious words uh, is the fact that uh, many of us, prior to salvation, did not use what we call gracious words. The words were salty, as it says here next, but that, that has a different meaning than what we think. The word, uh, a lot of people are just so used to just talking very crass. In some settings, it would be very inappropriate. I love meeting people that uh, from time to time, you know, just in conversations and different things, and I'll be talking with them, and they're just dropping F-bomb after F-bomb, and just da-da-da, and then they say, oh, by the way, what do you do for a living? I love it. It's a great reaction. <laughs> it's like, 
Well, I'm a pastor. And then it's like, it doesn't stop. Oh, blank, you didn't tell me you were a blanking pastor. I was like, great. You know, we're just adding to this even more. Not that it means anything. I just think it's funny. I just do. I mean, I grew up in that. I used to use the same words and everything, but I just think it's always funny just getting the reaction from people. I remember years ago, we had a young sailor here. He was married, had a kid or two, and uh, we had an event at the church, and everyone was inviting people to come out, and we had a, you know, one of those big days where people came out. He came and found me uh, somewhere during the event as we were all just you know, having fun, and he goes, Pastor, I'm so, I'm so, I feel so bad. I said, what? What happened? And he, you could just see he was flushed in the face. He goes, I feel horrible. He goes, one of my coworkers is here. I said, oh, that's great. No, he says, not great. I said, Why? He said, he knows what I'm really like. He hears everything I say, and now he's here. I didn't even invite him to come. I'm, I'm embarrassed he's even here because he could tell stories about me. And I, I said, why don't you go and just say, hey, so glad you're here. Sorry for being a bad example of a Christian. And I, said, I don't know if he ever did it, but I just said, hey, that's, just be honest. What are you going to do, lie? What are you going to do, just hide from him for the rest of your life? You can't. That's part of our journeys. We're idiots sometimes. So confess to God, confess to whoever it needs to be, and just move on. And so anyways, sometimes our, our speech betrays us. You say you're this, but you don't act like it. You don't talk like it. So gracious words here, actually interesting. It's, it, several commentators actually say it's kind of a combination of God's grace, grace and also human graciousness. And so that makes sense when you consider it. As a Christian now, I should be, I don't know if channeling is the right word, but I should be uh, uh, demonstrating God's grace, meaning speaking favorably, speaking kindly. But also as a human that has been changed from my old nature, I should be speaking graciously to others as well. Secondly, the word salty here. Now, many of us have seen the word salty. It's used... Uh, typically for people who have kind of a, a poor mouth, potty mouth as some would say, or, or just maybe uh, sarcastic or negative. So well, that's a salty mouth if I've ever seen one. Well, that's a salty person. We have bumper stickers about being salty. We have stores named salty. And some of it is related to maritime. Some of it's just uh, a play on words. But the word salty here is very interesting. In, in old writings, it was actually used to demonstrate wit, Not humor, but just a cleverness of how to say things, a wit or a sense about them. And it wasn't that they were harsh or sarcastic, it was that they just knew how to choose appropriate words for the occasion. Very interesting. So here we see that we speak with wisdom. According to the Apostle Paul, wisdom is gracious words and witty words, or words that have the proper sense for the situation. And then I want you to notice here, lastly, in verse number six, it says that you may know how you ought to answer a man. So there's two things here. One is that you, Christian, who God is calling you to be a witness of this mystery, but then also here to the people who are asking questions about what? Your faith. Maybe the change they see in your life. So we have the Christian and we have the non-Christian that you may know how to answer that non-Christian based on what your faith is. And so this is not only gracious words, salty words, but knowledgeable words. Notice 1 Peter 3.15, but sanctify, that means set God apart in your heart, set the Lord God in your heart, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. You ought to be, as a Christian, always ready to give an answer regarding your faith. That doesn't mean you have to debate people. It doesn't mean that you have to attack them. God doesn't need your defense. He's a big boy. He, he understands. But you should be ready if somebody asks you. So, and this, this is my prayer, and I mentioned this last week. All the secular companies I work for, even while I was trained to be a pastor, and even as a pastor, I would say, Lord, help me be a witness to somebody today as I go in. And sometimes it was because of a hardship that took place in someone's home. And they brought it to work, and they said, hey, John, can I talk to you? It's like, sure. And they were getting ready to go through a divorce, or they had a child in the hospital, or something else. Or sometimes it was just, hey, you go to church, right? Yeah, well, hey, what church is that? And I would just say, thank you, Lord. And I would be able to talk about God or talk about church. Use it. doesn't mean you're going to be able to sit down and have a full dialogue about God, but 
using those opportunities to talk about your faith and using those to be a witness for Christ. And so gracious words, salty words, appropriate words, if I could say it that way, knowledgeable words, knowing your crowd. I gave this illustration the first hour, and I'll use it again. Uh, I had a friend named Howie. He was a professional golfer. He got saved in Southern California. Now, Howie golfed with Mickelson and Daly. Some of you might know those names. And uh, this is back early on in the 90s. And uh, Howie was never make it all the way officially to the Pro Tour, but amateur or pro. But Howie was a hardcore partier. When I say hardcore partier, you see partier, and you would put him at the top of the list, and he would be the run running the show. I mean, that, this was just who he was before he got saved. Well, Howie, after he got saved, turned that around, and he was a hardcore Jesus freak, okay? I mean, uh, he, he became scary uh, in his presentation uh, about the change that took place. He was so passionate, so excited about the change that took place in his life for God that he went out, I have a big study Bible here, but he went out and got one probably twice this size, and uh, he would carry it with him everywhere, and he would just throw it down on the table and say to people, what do you think about that? I mean, this is just a bold personality. And, and then he would find someone and just say, hey, do you know for sure if you die today to go to heaven? No, you're going to hell then. You need to listen to me. Seriously, this is the way he talked to people. And I was like, Howie, you're going to scare people away. He goes, and then he would come to me. Well, don't you think they need to know this? I'm like, yes, they need to know it. But your, your tone and your approach, they are not going to receive that from you. And, uh, and he was just so bold in his face. And if he heard of anyone that, that was from a different Christian church or religion, he'd go up, to, he'd study what they believed, then he'd go back to them and just rip on them. What they, you know, your church teaches this, that's a lie. This church you're teaching this, that's a lie. This cult teaches And he would just go off. I was like, you're not helping people. Same guy would go down to the bars he wants you to go to that they'd have to drag out of there sloppy drunk. And he would take that Bible, he'd go inside there, and he would just start preaching in the bar. You're all going to hell unless you repent and trust Christ. Like, oh my goodness. Appreciate the zeal, but there was nobody that was going to listen to that. Now, we could get to heaven and there was somebody in there needed to hear that, which does happen sometimes. But I said, I, we talked to Howie, said, How, Howie, you need to understand that people need to know you care about them. <laughs> they need, you also need to know their setting, their background. And, uh, and it took him years. And I don't know if he ever fully got it figured out, but I mean, he seemed to be calming down over the years, but yet at the same time, he was a bold witness for Christ, and he was just so passionate about the change that took place. He said, I was going to split hell wide open. I want everyone to know the blessing of being saved. And so I said, well, maybe if you start with that, that's a good inroad. <laughs> and uh, so again, having, having knowing your audience and, and being knowledgeable about what to present and when to present it, just very quickly, the examples of Jesus in conversations with people, just so we understand this idea of being knowledgeable. Jesus spoke to religious leaders directly, challenging them by quoting Scripture and reminding them of God's original intentions. You know, Jesus was the harshest with the religious leaders of his day that were teaching false teaching. And that's, that's understandable. I've had, to, I've had to be in conversations with people that I knew were teaching false doctrine, and I was a little more firm and direct with them, saying, no, that is a lie. That is not, that is not found in the Scripture. Well, that's your interpretation. That's always the, the out for people. That's your interpretation. No, there's only one interpretation of these passages, and you're wrong. And, of course, that usually ends up nowhere, but, that's, uh, but Jesus did the same thing. He would challenge religious leaders because he said, you're wrong. You're reinterpreting this. You've changed the meaning of it. Jesus spoke to Satan. If you remember Matthew chapter 4, he quoted Scripture and rebuked him. And so you need to understand that sometimes you in your own sinfulness, your weaknesses, look up the verses that deal with those things. And when you're tempted in those areas, quote them. Lord, help me right now. I'm struggling with this weakness. Keep Satan away from me. And the Bible says resist the devil and he will flee. So better have some ammunition with you. Jesus spoke to the woman caught in adultery. How so? With compassion and equity. He didn't lambast her. He actually pointed out the sins of the others, we assume, what he wrote in the sand. Pretty powerful moment. Love to, when we get to heaven, love to hear the rest of that story. But he was very compassionate. But he also was equitable in that. He told her to go and sin no more. Don't keep doing what you're doing. 
but you are forgiven. Jesus spoke to the rich man with a request that revealed the rich man's true heart. He bragged about all of his wealth. He obeyed the commandments since he was young. He says, what do I lack to enter into the kingdom of heaven? Jesus says, one thing you lack. Go and sell everything you have and follow me. What? Jesus put him to task. He, he knew exactly what was in his heart. His riches were more important to him than following God, actually. And Jesus spoke to the woman at the well, offering her a real relationship. You know the story of the woman at the well? Jesus said to her very clearly, you have had five husbands, and the one you're living with right now is not your husband? That would have been a very interesting conversation to have with somebody. And he says, let me offer you a real relationship, something that you've been craving with all these different men that you can never find. I'll give you something real if you put your faith and trust in God alone. Jesus spoke to the rabbi Nicodemus, skilled at the law, he gave him a new concept about being born again by the Spirit of God. And the rabbi says, I don't understand that. He says, are you not a teacher of law and you can't understand this? Jesus knew his crowd. And some of you, you work with people every single day. You'll spend more time with the people you work with, perhaps, than your own family members if you stay there for 40 years. Crazy when you think about it. But study the people you are around a lot. Ask God to give you insight, knowledge on how to approach them with the gospel. Be amazed at how God loves to answer those prayers. So what's the takeaway? Jesus adjusted his content of the conversation to the need and experience of the person that he spoke to. This idea of speaking gracious words, salty words, and knowledgeable words really takes time for us to spend time in prayer and asking God for direction, but he's called us all to be witnesses of Christ. If you're a Christian, he's called you to be a witness. That means in actions and in, and in speech. So the takeaway for the believer is to, to watch his or her mouth is that they must watch in prayer. That's the first thing. Pray for opportunities as Paul was asking us, asking that crowd, pray that they have opportunities. Pray for wisdom. Pray for grace. Pray for understanding how to go about witnessing the different types of people that you are associated with. To the unbeliever today, are you open to receive in Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? It's a very simple question, but it's also something that if the Holy Spirit is knocking on the door of your heart, as they say, you sense the weight of your sin, you sense that you believe that Jesus is the only way for salvation, then man, you're ready. Tell Jesus that you believe that he's God, that he died on that cross for your sins, he was buried, he rose again from the dead, he did everything necessary to pay your sin debt in its fullness. He is your substitute for what you, you deserve, but he did it for you. And if you would call out to him and ask him to forgive you and save your soul, he would absolutely do so. To the believer then, are you willing to pray and seek to be an effective witness for Christ by watching your mouth in this way? Spending time in prayer. Using gracious and witty words, being knowledgeable about your audience. The Bible tells us that for the Christian, we're to be subtle as a what? Serpent yet gentle as a dove. You're going to have to really think and plan. Be strategic in how you go about being a witness, sometimes to your own family members, to your own friends, to your coworkers, to your bosses. I've had opportunities to speak to people that I never thought I'd have an opportunity to speak to. I've always prayed, God, give me an opportunity to be bold in my witness enough where it wasn't come off as condescending, but hey, let me ask you about your faith. That's usually a pretty easy one. But what does that open up doors? You're surprised. Who are people of faith and who are definitely not people of faith? But it opens up the door. And so all this requires purposeful prayer, walking in wisdom, speaking both gracious and appropriate words, and God delights in answering those kind of prayers for his people. Well, Father, we thank you for this time. I thank you for the privilege of being able to share these truths from your Bible. Thank you for giving